Okay, so now you should be able to see that we are recording. Um, so last time we really sort of gave a big overview of how the tutor looks. And the thing that I really want you to remember from this, because I was you know, working on the Elizabethan, um, which should be available to you now, um, is how important the silhouette sort of mirrors the philosophy or the thoughts or the ideas of Henry in a sense. So that idea that Henry being, you know, the center of it all, how he perceives it, is the box, right? He's this big um, person in general, but he adds exaggerated sleeves, he adds exaggerated fullness to his body to make him look as though the clothes themselves are really um, changing the shape of his body. And in turn, the female silhouette is very triangular and um, somewhat contained, okay? So keep that in mind, it's really important. And when we get to Elizabethan, we're gonna see a very similar idea, but we're gonna see it switch because ultimately the, the big picture of it is that the, because the monarch changes and she then becomes the most important person, we're going to see a very, 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 um, uh, I guess you could say uh, a uh, very strong dynamic of what women's silhouettes are in then a change in men's silhouettes as well. So ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to looking at the slides, which is always so exciting. I know, where are our slides today? Let me pull that up. Well, let me... That's interesting, huh, okay. Give me two seconds. Let's try that again. There we go, boop, boop. And right now you should be able to see our slides. Okay, so here we are with Henry. Um, and you could certainly minimize me. There's no need to see too much of what I'm doing here. But um, I'm not gonna go into full screen mode because as we know, then you can't see the mouse and you can't see what I'm, I'm talking about. But we do wanna reiterate everything we talked about last time. So we wanna look at the big picture of what Henry is wearing. We start off here at the top and we see underneath, we see our doublet, which has been slashed and puffed again giving us the illusion, giving us the idea that the shirt is being pulled through. Now in truth, ultimately a lot of times that was just a little piece of fabric that was sewn behind so it would permanently stay there. Because you have to imagine if, if I took my shirt and I pulled it out, the minute I would move it would sort of suck back in. So what we often see is that those things were sort of attached. Underneath all of this, if we look up here at the neck, we can see the phrase, which is giving us a sense of the shirt collar um, that is sort of open and falling down partially because of the fullness of his face, but that becomes fashion. That becomes something important that even if you're not full of face, you're going to take in. On top of the doublet, we see the bases. And again, remember those are sort of like I'm wearing today, vest-like, overall, but a super deep opening in the front, which holds on to those skirts, which is really what those skirts are attached to. Then here we're seeing the shamer, this very full robe, this one made out of red velvet with these incredibly full sleeves. And we can see because the upper part of it is folded over, we can see the entirety of it is lined in fur. Now, as I had said, this part here, this triangular part where we take the whole thing and open it up, we would today call a lapel. In this period, we call them reveres. And I was, you know, I know that I missed that on the, the terms list, but that is now on the terms list. So you shouldn't have any problem. Okay. The, um, looking down again, like I said, we don't fully know what is happening here. Whether we have upper stocks and lower stocks, we can definitely see lower stocks, but we can see that somehow those stocks, whether it's upper or just you know a full chest, are sort of contained um, together 
with that cod piece. And again, this is really speaking to the, the kind of implied virility that comes from this over-exaggerated cod piece. So keep that in mind. Um, let's see. So then we have uh, the lower stocks. And then look down here at the shoes. We didn't quite talk about that last time, but you can see these very flat, sort of angled out at the front shoe that we call duck bill shoes. I'm going to switch so I can drag the, the chat over for a second. Come on. Come on. Go with me. Uh, no, it's not going to play. I got to stop share for just a second. Boop. And then I got to move this. Boop. Oh, come on. Oh, so many challenges today. OK, well. Um, I can, at the end of this, it will send you to um, the, the page with the, uh, I don't like how that works. Let me see if I bring this over here. And then I can see the chat. There we go. Um, where all the recordings are. I'll make sure to, to triple check those so that you can see them. There we are. We're back. Sometimes Zoom doesn't like to play. Uh, but you know, there'll be a list of where all the recorded ones are. Okay, we're back. So we can see, again, the cod piece, we can see the, the lower stocks and those dock build shoes. And you can see how flexed and forward those are. Now, just like real life, we see different shapes of shoes come in and out of fashion, whether it's very pointy, whether it's very rounded, um, even our own trainers or sneakers often go through these sort of fashionable styles. And we can see that it's no different with um, the shoes here. Notice that those are slashed as well. If we sort of scale up a bit, you can see that there are tiny little cuts all over them, giving them a very similar feeling to everything else that is going on. Um, and possibly, again, possibly, this was because Henry's feet themselves were large. And so he you know, had an accommodation for the shoe and then he in turn um, made it uh, fashionable. Now, when we think about those Italian Renaissance styles that we saw, those very open-necked or low-necked padlocks and uh, pore points, you know, we can see, and this is an early picture, I believe, of Henry, how that just doesn't look right on him. You know, again, because he is a big guy, you can see that the, the silhouette overall just feels a bit strange. So we could see how he in turn sort of adapts all of these pieces into something that sort of suits his body more. And again, going back, we can see those bases very clearly in that Italian Renaissance painting that translates when we get to images like this, that we can start to see the parts of the, um, we could see those bases just sort of sitting right underneath. And if you notice, Henry, again, has a bit of a belly and everything sort of scoops under that. And as we look at other people in this period, we're going to see that they're padding the front of themselves to look rounder. And part of the reason of that is um, not only so that they look like the king, so everybody kind of feels as though they're part of the king's world, but it also being a bigger person is considered to be luxurious because that means that you have wealth, which means that, you know, because you can eat. So, so that sort of size um, matters, I guess, in this period. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so here in this illustration, we can see a lot of the same details that we saw in the previous illustration, actually a very similar hat. And if you really look at this one, and this one, you can see that they're practically the same stance, the same positioning. So that may mean that he actually never uh, uh, stood for this, that he, he didn't model for this, that they just copied an, other, uh, an earlier painting. And that perhaps is why we see some of those things. But we can see this large chimere in gold velvet with the tabs hanging down. We see this fur um, revere sort of opened up. Again, if you imagine, you could take that just like I showed on the, you can't see it, but it's over here, the shimmer there. If you closed it up, you could sort of get the sense of the robes that we saw in both um, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. 
but opened up creating that revere. Notice the phrase, the collar sort of folding over. We see the doublet with all the slashes. We can see the beautiful jewels that run down the front of it. And we can also see the jewels that run down the sleeves. Now, I had mentioned this before and we're gonna talk about it both now and then uh, when we get to uh, Elizabethan, but we notice that these sleeves look to be made out of strips. And the idea of these strips we call panes, P-A-N-E-S. And they are individual strips of textile that are embroidered that are joined at certain intervals, you know, sort of like when we talked about the ionic keton perhaps or such, but they're, they're pinned or joined at intervals so that the shirt can come through naturally. And even if we look at his, the, the skirting of the bases, we get sort of a pain's detail on that where it looks like it's made up of individual pieces, though in this case, it isn't. Um, we can see this very broad chain around the shoulders that we call the chain of order, as well as jewelry. And then notice at the cuffs, we see a bit of flange, a bit of the kamika popping out. And that sort of sets us in motion for seeing a little bit of white at the wrist and a little bit of white at the collar. And um, you know, even if we think about today, our, our jackets, if I was wearing a suit jacket, say that little bit of a shirt cuff showing is considered to be good tailoring, right? So we see that uh, evolve, excuse me, into um, a, you know, a number of different styles that we understand today. Here we see another um, you know, set, again, kind of the same thing. However, we can see a little bit clearer those bases. And notice that the doublet does have that more Italian Renaissance neck, but, but really, you know, if we wanted to, we could sort of be like, here we are at the beginning, and then it's modified a little bit, and then we go back to this sort of style. And we could see all the pieces that go into that. And again, look at the jewels, look at the, you know, this front feels like panes as well, right? that they're individual strips that are just sort of joined by those, those uh, fibulae or those brooches. Now, again, this isn't just Henry. You know, this is sort of all over the place. And um, this is, I believe, Francois I, who is the King of France. And we can see that he has sort of taken a little bit of the Italian Renaissance, which looks a little bit better on him, I think, um, as well as, these magnificent silhouettes. And we can see the shamer in this case, not lined in fur, but it's revere sort of tells us that it has been um, detailed with some embroidered trim on the edge, but we can see how that revere is folded over. We can see the bases in this case, feeling a little bit more patlocky, right? And then revealing the doublet underneath. And we can see the doublet here, and we can see the doublet sleeve and panes here, which feel even more like panes. You can see very closely, let's, let's scoop this up, but you can see that they are ties, right? You can see that they're little ties and we're gonna see an awesome illustration coming up. Um, no, the hat is just the popular hat, you know? Um, we rarely see pictures. I don't actually think there is a picture of Henry with a crown on and perhaps um, the crowns were considered to be um, too fanciful in a sense, um, because there probably was something that was tied to of the people. But, you know, Henry loved this sort of hat. <coughs> Excuse me, we look at every illustration of Henry, we see this beret style hat with very similar details, Byzantine like details. So you could see how that would ultimately um, become fashionable for many. So when we start to break it down, we can see, you know, things like this. So this is that Kamika with the black work on it. And again, it looks like Sharpie, right? But this is actually embroidery onto that linen. And as I said, the family, um, the head of the family, the, the wife of the family would make the shirts for um, and shifts and such, the Kamika for the entirety of the family, even if she was queen. So you know, each of those queens would make shirts for Henry. Now, here we can see just a little bit more, and this is still in that Tudor realm, but notice that we're seeing this idea of those upper and lower stocks. We can see that his doublet has a peplum, 
on it. And in fact, there's kind of a secret there, but we'll get to that next time. But we could see that there's some sort of torso covering, which actually reveals another torso covering here. We could see these sleeves with all these slashes um, and probably very much like these upper stocks, which are, again, a term we'll eventually use, which we call breeches. But because he's not wearing the bases, we can see a bit more of the upper part. Notice how they follow the line of the leg, very much like the um, hose did before. Notice this whole thing sort of splits open so we can see the cod piece, um, which in this case, again, it, your eye sort of is drawn to it. We can see that the doublet has a very high neck and a bit of that phrase popping out. And then we can see the shamir on top of this with these very, very, very full sleeves. And then the reveres pull back showing us our fur interior. And that's a big dog. That's a dog and a half puppy. Um, and then down here we can see the shoes, which don't feel quite as duck build, but do have a bit of a broadness to them. Now this uh, painting, a very famous painting called The Ambassadors, gives us a little bit more of a sense of the variety of clothing. You know, if you're just looking at Henry, you're seeing you know, only one sort of style of clothing. But here we see two different people. We see somebody in more dress clothes and then somebody who is in much more casual clothes. Somebody who is in perhaps as we might call it a robe or a banyan or, um, you know, a home gown. Um, what makes this painting extra special is, and unfortunately, because we're not in the room, I can't truly show it to you, but this little bit that you see right here, um, this angled sort of brush stroke sort of goes down. If this was placed up on the wall and you were standing at the corner, what you would actually see is something compressed and it would be a skull. Um, and so they're playing around with perspective and visualization and such, giving you um, sort of a secret inside that. But if we look at the two figures here, we can see very clearly this gentleman that is here wearing something very, very, very similar to Henry. First of all, notice the beard. You know, everybody's now gonna have beards. It's just like today, one fashionable person starts to grow a beard and everybody's gonna have a beard. Uh, but we can see the beret. We can see the doublet here in red, not very, fancy per se. There are a couple slashes up here on top that you can sort of see. We can see the red, uh, the white fur lined of the shamer. And in fact, you can see the sleeves are panes that are lined in fur as well, and then tied in intervals down. And that fur, again, isn't a trim, but it's the fur from behind each one of these strips sort of coming off. So when you would move, those would break open and show the doublet underneath. If we look, we can see a pretty deep V and this black part obviously are the bases, giving us a little bit more fullness and a little hard to see, but we can see the leg in there. And then we can see those duck build shoes. And in this case, with a bit of a roundness in the toe, we can see you know, a bit of jewelry, very fancy. Um, and you know a very similar style to Henry, but not quite as extreme. And then if we look at the other person here, we can see that this is probably an at-home outfit or a casual outfit um, where they have a doublet and we can see the, sh the kamika, we can see the phrase of the kamika, but then with this sort of fur gown or robe over on top of it. And what's really swell about a lot of these portraits is um, we can see a lot of the interior items. So we get a sense of furniture. We get a sense of everyday objects. We can see scientific objects up on top. And then on the lower shelf, we can see sort of ideas of the humanities, whether it's pipes or a lute or open books. Um, you know, we're getting a sense of, you know, kind of the pantheon of all things that are important, science, music, the humanities. Um, but if you can look up this painting, The Ambassadors, and you can find out a little bit about that, um, that skull that's hidden, I'm pointing, I can't point, uh, that skull that is hidden down here at the bottom of the painting by the rugs. 
Here we see a much more simple style. And if you look at the hat, you can see the beret in there, but you can also see um, a bit of a brim on it as well. And we sort of see these tabs that are rolling, rolled over, excuse me, um, that are very similar to the headdresses, the gabled headdress, or the um, even in some way the French um, hood that, that sort of tell us that it is Tudor. We can see that they're wearing something underneath right? Underneath it all that could be a doublet, but then notice there's kind of a second doublet on top of that all over the Kamika. So that first doublet is open showing a little bit underneath. Um, and then on top of that, we can see the shamir, and then we can see the under doublet sleeve here. So we see this, what looks almost like a stomacher, right? Um, that's actually what we're seeing here. So this is telling us that this black doublet that is here because um, we can see that extra collar is probably not a doublet at all, but we'll learn about that next class. Um, but we can see it's a, you know it's a pretty natural looking period. Look at this guy. I call him Sean Connery, even though it's not Sean Connery, um, RIP. But um, we can see in this case, his, his doublet buttoned all the way up to the neck. It's hard to tell what's truly going on in here. Um, Cause I don't think you can see bases. So it may be in this case that the bases are attached to something that isn't open, but is completely, you know, full bodied like the doublet. And then underneath we can see that second doublet. And here we can see beautiful examples of the paints, right? Where they look like they're tied with these two little beads on them, giving us a sense of those strips of fabric. Um, we can see the, the necklace around his neck, and we can also see the sword being worn on the side, which we've seen from Henry as well. Now, one of the things you'll notice is this idea of gloves becomes important, you know, as, a, as somebody who would be traveling and such, even today, we wear leather gloves. But often when you see a glove in somebody's hand taken off and in their hand, that's implying that somebody is, um, is showing you respect and showing you humility, I guess you could say, because that hand, that right hand is now ungloved so that you could reach forward and perhaps shake their hand. Now, one of the, um, a great artist, um, Bruegel from the period, often shows people working out in fields and such. And here is a great illustration that shows somebody um, in this case, a young person, a scholar, laying out in, I guess you could say, dreaming of what's going on. But we could see that he is all kind of untethered. You know, we could see where his doublet and the points would tie onto the hose. In this case, right, they're all full shots, they're full-legged hose. And you can see how his, his cod piece is starting to slip a little bit. Um, and also we can see that magnificent shamer or robe, this, this overgown with very full bodied, um, uh, uh, with, excuse me, a full body that when he's laying out, it's sort of folded all on top of each other. Now the shamer has very long sleeves, but you can see how it would open up, but look how great this is. We can see all the pieces and it's not as formal that we can, you can see how things are all tied together and how they would all work together. Now, that idea of slashing came, uh, comes from a couple different places. One um, sort of urban legend, as I had mentioned last time, uh, was from Italy with Florence and Venice fighting. One was up north with the Swiss fighting. Uh, but ultimately, these people, these soldiers came back with slashed clothes, you know, from fighting. And so it became sort of this idea of national pride to cut your clothes to sort of say, you know, we were in war. And ultimately, what it does is it becomes fashionable. And you can see that almost anything can be slashed. In this case, we see a Kamika with something over it, it feels like bases, but leads to just sort of a um, an upper part of the, the upper stocks. And then you can see that those upper stocks are slashed in all sorts of details. It almost looks like plant matter. It looks like um, 
I don't know, sort of seaweed sort of laying on the body. And then we can see the lower stocks and we can see those duck-billed shoes. Um, and slashing can get really, really, really out of control. Um, so we have to be careful of how much we slash. Here we can see young Edward, who is Henry's only son, um, who died at the age of 15 from tuberculosis, I believe, and then set in motion um, all sorts of series of, of monarchs that came after that. But notice how in this case, the clothes are wearing him, right? This little guy is probably nowhere near the scale of Henry, but notice that his clothes sort of imply the scale of Henry with this very, very full um, doublet, right? Notice that the sleeves, though not quite puffed in the same way as that, do give a sense of fullness through the shoulders. And then if we look at the sleeves themselves, we can see that they're slashed. Notice that the, the sort of upper part, the doublet, leads into a peplum of its own. It probably isn't bases per se. Um, and what's pretty great about this is if we make it a little bigger, we can see just the tiniest bit of the upper stocks happening here, which then lead to the lower stocks going down here. He is dressing, yes, he looks fabulous. Um, and we can start to see, you know, how <laughs> it is quality. Um, it sort of mirrors Henry, but, but it, you know, the proportions of, of Henry don't necessarily play out well on everybody else. And then down here, we can see the duck build shoes going on there. And then we can even see the tiniest little cod piece happening, peeking through the peplum, the sort of skirting of the peplum, okay? And again, notice the details behind. Everything feels very heavy, feels very uh, formal. Notice this chair has these huge claws holding onto balls, um, you know, that, that would make it feel incredibly um, intimidating, even as a piece of furniture. Now, you may not know this, but I do love illustrations of children in formal clothing because they always look so uncomfortable and it kind of makes me giggle a little bit. I know, I'm mean. But here we see a family um, and we can see the girls and we can see the boys and notice that the youth are sort of dressed in a lot of ways in a very similar manner. I mean, we can see elements of it that, that represent Henry and elements that sort of we've seen before with his wives, but notice how there is kind of a homogeny to how they wear clothes. We can see that the, the young men seem to be wearing uh, more of a gown, more like a, a surcoat than really doublet and um, a doublet in bases. And then notice that the young women have a similar silhouette, but is somewhat contained on the body. And certainly as they got older, they probably would, would feel more formal. But we can see that they're all dressed similar. Now the young person all the way in the front could be either a boy or a girl. There was a lot of um, androgyny, I guess you could say, in the youngest. Um, and sometimes it was more sort of boy-centric, more, more gender-centric, I guess you could say, as we might look at it, um, uh, because there was, was sort of a simplicity in children. For example, here we see the grumpiest little child ever, and probably our first instinct would be, because we see the farthingale, we see that skirt, would probably be that this is a girl. However, this is a young boy. And in many cases, they would dress them for movement and such. It was easier to change diapers and such in sort of gowns as opposed to, to other types of clothes. But there's also an urban legend that says if, you know, you don't want your heir stolen. So you don't want people to see that they're the, the heir, which again, lots of gender issues or politics here, but uh, the heir would be generally a male. So they would dress it like um, a young girl or at least in women's clothing. 
so that it would be um, less noticeable. It's a little weird, I promise you. Okay, here we again see Edward as a small child and we can see, you know, a lot of similar details, whether it be the beret or that kind of the, the bases and the, the uh, Kamika and also the doublet, but obviously adapted for a child. And here we can see the, the coif as well, that linen cap with another connection on it. Because you know, if you're a baby and you have a beret on, you're just gonna pull it off. So staple it to their head. And then, you know, to sort of go along with the most miserable child ever here, we see the most creepy dog ever. Um, and if you imagine that this is a child, right, a young person, then you see this dog. This dog would probably be about the size of a hamster or, or a, a, a guinea pig or something, you know, so it makes it even more scary how tiny this dog is. But we can see this kind of gender mixing in this with some elements like that square neckline that is very, um, similar to the women's gowns that we saw, but then we see kind of this doublety, shimmery element going on as well as the beret. So, you know, when you're seeing these, it's impossible to tell the gender um, just based on the clothes. Here we see Henry's court. I'm just gonna move this over just a little bit. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this isn't Henry's court. This is um, Thomas More who is the center person here, his family and relations. And we can see many different varieties within this portrait that show, you know, even though sometimes it'll feel like, as I call it, second verse, same as the first. If you know that reference, then you get an extra point today. But uh, we can see variations within the way that things are, are worn and how they, they sort of match up to, um, the individual. But notice that the clothes feel very heavy. They feel very uh, layered. And notice even on the women, this idea of the stomacher, you know, in this case, not so triangular, but sort of more rectangular um, with the, the crossing of lacing over it. And we can still see sort of this segmented sleeve detail happening down here. We can see up here, on um, this gentleman and even this gentleman, a more of an Italian Renaissance style, right? Or even that Gothic transition. And again, you wanna see another really creepy dog. Look at that. That will haunt your dreams. It's nightmare food, I promise you. Really creepy. Looks like a Sphinx. Anyway. <laughs> um, here we see, some armor, and this is Henry's armor, and you, you know, it just looks like armor, but we can see how sort of square and boxy he was. He was an incredible athlete and very active until um, he was in a jousting accident that hit his leg um, that eventually uh, got festered and, um, and infected. And apparently, you know, this is after, I want to say this is after Anne Boleyn. I think it was during Jane Seymour that it happened, but it is said you could smell him from like rooms away. This leg was so gross and so infected. And you have to imagine for those young girls who eventually married him, that must have been a treat. Um, but we can see how boxy it is. And you have to imagine this, this armor, if I remember correctly, it's like 6'2". You know, it's, it's so big and so overpowering. Um, and we can see some advancements. It does look a little bit like C-3PO, but you can see advancements in armor and its importance um, in how things, you know, sort of sit on the body. And when we think of those highly ornate armors, if you go to, say, the Metropolitan Museum, um, those aren't medieval, I guess, or from the Middle Ages. They're really from the Renaissance. And most of them were just worn for um, events and such. We'll even see in some cases armor being worn in everyday life. It's a little weird. It's a little weird, but got to protect ourselves. And so here we see a, a couple together and you can see how much you know, the, the space the gentleman takes up and how little space, at least in the shoulder area or such, 
that the the women take up and, and you know if you have those sort of side by side you see that it then as it moves down they sort of switch places where the women and their gowns seem to take so much more space and the gentlemen in these pictures tend to um take up less space overall we can see you know this idea of this open neck even if it isn't being used in that italian style is sort of emphasized through those chain of order and such and again that adds for the gentleman a much broader um, quality across the shoulders we can see the doublet we can see the phrase we can see the beret we can see the chamair when we look at the woman that is next to him, we can see this very open neckline that we're gonna see a million times, so keep your eye on that. We can see a bit of the shift popping out just at the top of this gown, this very sort of trapezoidal or square neckline really tells us that it's Tudor. And notice how those sleeves are just precariously on the shoulder point there. We can see these necklaces all just very, 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 heavy and Byzantium uh, in their shapes and forms leading down into the neckline. And then if we look at her sleeve, we can see that it is, you know, cut, it is a segmented sleeve. And then that's the undersleeve with the oversleeve being pulled up almost to the shoulder, but just really beautiful. And then that French hood that I mentioned many times, you can see the hood itself. And then behind it, you can see the veil that is coming from the back of it. So when we look at clothes, uh, we rarely see images of undergarments and we, we do have one or two pieces, <coughs> excuse me, going on. But here we can see a very, very, very faithful reproduction of undergarments. And at the top, we can see the stay and you can see that there are a number of channels or little, little openings in which some sort of rigidity can be put into it. And then we can see that it has a little bit of a peplum with a name that we'll get next time. And then below we can see, so the structure uh, or the support, you know, very triangular. And then this, the structure underneath the farthingale is also very rigid. You can see that in this case it is a piece of muslin or canvas or textile that then has sort of channels in it where you could put reed or wood or even metal into it to give you, again, a very, very, very full silhouette. And notice up here on the shoulders, those very similar to the stays that I showed you last time, they have those tied straps that keep it in place, keep your shoulders down and in place, but you could push those out, tie them very tight, and then mount your gown onto them to make sure that those sleeves can sit out as far as they are um, without falling down. We could have learned something in the 80s from that effect. So we have seen this before, Catherine of Aragon, and you can see how far out that gown goes onto the shoulders. And we can see the gown itself, we can see the sleeve pulled back, that very full triangular sleeve, the pendant sleeve or the conical sleeve, revealing the undersleeve. And we can see a bit of the shift at the wrist as well. Um, we can see that gabled headdress here, which feels again, like a gable of a house or a roof of a house. And then flipped back, we see the veiling. And here, um, there have been many, 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 many different people who've tried to figure out what, ex how exactly this worked, but more than likely it was a padded roll. This wasn't their hair sort of brought up and then tied with metal. Um, it was probably a padded section in there so that the hat set um, very cleanly and correctly on that. If you watch that Stitch in Time video, you saw the woman who was building the clothes for that. Um, who is a historical costume, um, well, I should say a historical clothing maker. She does reproduction clothing for all that. Um, and her books, The Tudor Tailor, really do break down um, how these clothes were probably made um, using extant garments and using um, information that is available. And you know, you're gonna see the queens that we already sort of talked about in here. Um, over and over, so that's okay. But here we see again Anne Boleyn, 
with that very sort of open neckline, that black work detail going around the neckline. But here we see a beautiful um, illustration of Queen Elizabeth as a young person. And notice again, that silhouette that is created. We can see how triangular and elongated that sense is going on there. Then we can see the overskirt, which is part of that gown. And then underneath that, we can see the jupe, the decorative skirt that is happening. Sorry, I got it. For some reason, the air conditioning turned on. And so I had this big cold, cold blast hitting me. But you can see the triangularity there. And then you can see the triangularity in the skirt. Of course, to keep it that smooth, we would need that farthingale underneath. You can notice that there is a chain around her waist which sort of emphasizes the basque, that deep V in the front. And if you notice right behind the book, going down the jupe, a little blurry, I'm sorry, but you can see this chain. And what would that chain lead to? That pomander, that, that ball of metal um, that, that would have um, fragrance inside of it, you know, sort of potpourri that when it moved, it would sort of emit fragrance. So you can see how triangular this is. But what I also really love about this portrait, notice how far those sleeves are. It almost doesn't even look like a bodice. It looks like you know, sort of a bustier with then these ex sort of extra long kind of arm covers, right? It barely looks like it even touches the bodice. But what you can um, see, I don't know if you could really see it. We have that one picture coming up again. No, you can't quite. I think the real painting you can, but you know, this would sort of be all attached very tightly and then that front panel might connect over with those pins in place. And here we see her sister, Mary, and we can see as well how, how far out those um, sleeves or the, the sort of top of the bodice would go. And you can see why that would be so important that you had that stay underneath, that you could connect to there so it wouldn't slip off. We can see the fit at the top and then those sleeves folded back you know, revealing the lining and also revealing the under sleeves. And in this case, you can see that they're lined in black. They have sort of black piping around them. And then they have the puffs happening as well. And you can see back here that um, she's wearing the French hood with the um, veiling down the back. And here we can see, again, that silhouette in its extreme. Look how smooth that skirt looks. It doesn't look like there are tons and tons of petticoats under it, right? Where it's collapsing on itself, it looks like it's starched and rigid. And that's where those um, farthingale would be so important. Notice the jupe, that decorative underskirt there, and how um, visual that adds, or the, the, the visualness of that triangle adds to that sort of hourglass shape. And notice that the jupe and that undersleeve, that engagement, uh, sort of tie in together and give us that sense. And that, look at that fur. Those sleeves are lined in this beautiful sort of uh, grizzly fur, you know, that's sort of pulled back. And it shows a great deal of luxury. And then look down the center front. Now we can actually see that belt and the pomander at the end of it. Now, what's going on here is it could be ermine because we could see these little black sections in it, but ermine looks really specific. And this is much, 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 much later. This is um, a Victorian garment, late, um, or actually early Edwardian. But you could see that ermine was used here as well. And that ermine is that very, expensive fur, the, the, the fur itself of the, the ermine, which is like a weasel, is very, very white with that exception of the tail. And so when you sew them together, those little black tails make up all those little dots. And you can see many, many ermine being used. Each tail that you see would be an individual animal. So um, in this case, we can see at least 20 um, pelts that would be used. And it's super soft, it's like mink. Now, as we start to travel around Europe, we see different styles sort of taken on 
based on the country themselves. And here we see a Tudor gown that is starting to make the transition into more Elizabethan styles, but we can see that triangular farthingale, that conical farthingale happening there. This is Spain, I believe. Um, and we can see in this case, the very full sleeves, but in this, you know, they're not folded back, but they're actually slashed down the front of them and then just sort of uh, pinned up here into the arm itself, allowing us to see the, the undersleeve. And notice that this gown is a closed gown. You know, you get the sense that it could open up if you wanted to, but in this case, we're not. We're keeping it closed and it is tied with ribbons all the way down. Here we see an Italian dress um, and notice the uh, sort of more graphic nature of it, which I think is very, very beautiful and very open, but just really luxurious textile, probably being a cut velvet or such. And we can see those panes, <clears throat> excuse me, down the sleeves. You know, in this case, we don't have those sort of huge pendulous pendant sleeves. Uh, uh, we're just seeing the actual sleeve there with the panes very much from Italy with those segments, but it does have a little bit of fullness up here at the top. And then on her hair, sorry, on her head, over her hair, we can see the crispinette, right? That, that call, that net made out of gold um, ribbon or, or gold thread with then each of those individual pearls at each of the intersections. And if we look at this upper part, we can see that there's sort of a veiling or a, a wrap, I guess you could say, that's tucked into her bodice that is very similar. And then notice these great pearls in the choker, and then these beautiful little drop earrings. Here we see Jane Seymour, and we can see very similar things as we've seen before. And if we, you know, what makes this illustration so fantastic again is we can see very clearly that the front of this pulls over and then is pinned into place all the way down. And at her cuff, we can see a little bit of black work on her commit or her shift, excuse me. And we can see, you know, the sleeve underneath matching the jupe. And then we can see the chain for the pomander heading down. Um, Mary Stewart. We can see very similar ideas happening. Sometimes I know it's difficult because it sort of looks the same, looks the same, looks the same, but you can notice that each one has a slightly different style. What's really cool about this one is it, it the, the shift that is underneath is almost like a man's shift that it is coming all the way up to the neck with kind of that phrase happening. And we can see the phrase is gonna start to evolve, I guess you could say into something very different, which is, a much more um, explosive bit around the neck. Now, this is a later illustration. This is actually from, uh, it's German, but it is from around the time of the Elizabethan and allows us to see a couple things. The most important thing is that idea of the bum roll. And we will see this again, I promise you, when we get to Elizabethan, but you, you can see this sort of donut or bagel that is being tied around the waist to give the skirt some fullness. And if we look all the way in the back up here, we can see one of those hanging out. And you can only imagine that those would be scaled to the kind of dress or the gown that would be used. Now I had said um, about those beads that tied the sleeves, how decorative and interesting they are. This is a Spanish gown. This is Elizabeth. Um, of Spain, who was Philip's second wife. Philip was first married to um, Mary the I, so created a unification between Spain and England. And then this was his second wife who was from France. So she's very fashionable in some ways. But what I love about this illustration is the sleeve. So in a sense, these sleeves, are pained, but notice that those pains are running diagonally, candy cane stripe around, and then are tied with these little beads, right? And what I'm always sort of thinking of when I look at these 
are kind of like a twist of the crown of thorns or something. It's very natural feeling. Um, we could see very clearly this square trape trapezoidal neckline. And then we can see some sort of influence of men's doublets and where men's clothes will start to go as we go along. Here we can see, again, very similar silhouettes, but just some different ways that we can accessorize or we can sort of make them our own. Now, Catherine Parr, let's make this a little bit smaller. There we go. Catherine Parr, as I mentioned before, seems to be wearing less of a gown like we saw for most people and much more of a robe, you know, some sort of loose body gown that is then belted. And with that, and when we see this picture of Mary one, we can see that those gowns don't necessarily have to be open necked. If you're an older person, perhaps you could have a much more closed garment. And some of that may come from the idea of this ropa that we've seen before. And this is a little bit more Elizabethan, but it gives you the sense. The ropa that we saw in the Italian Renaissance will continue forward. And that ropa is a, a garment either with, in this case, a smallish sleeve, but not the full sleeve. And we can see that this sort of feels like a chimere as well, but is open body, is very full. Now, when we're looking at research of this period, we also have to be careful because we see revival elements happening throughout many, many, many periods. And this, though it feels like the Tudor that we saw, notice, that it isn't the right silhouette. The skirt kind of feels that way, but it's so much softer, so much rounder, but it's really the bodice that gives it away to me. Notice how it feels much more round. It feels like what I would call a, a wasp bodice. It feels like the thorax um, of the, or the abdomen, excuse me, of a wasp or a bug. And that's because this is actually a Victorian a late Victorian reproduction of a Tudor gown. And in fact, I believe somebody was trying to show Tudor clothing, but instead sort of melded what was fashionable from the Victorian era and represented Tudor clothing on it. So we do have to be careful because this is where primary research could really throw us, could really change how we look at clothes. And so once the Tudor realm changes hands, and as we'll talk about next time, it goes from Edward to Mary I, and then from Mary I to Elizabeth I, we're going to see a, a significant style change because um, Elizabeth will focus in a lot of ways on this triangular shape through the torso, but the fullness of everything that her dad had, whether it's the Shamir or the even in a sense, the skirting. So we're gonna to start to see everything fill out and become very different. Um, two last pictures, just so we can see. These sort of give you a sense of what those shoes might look like um, in their sort of simple form, but they just look like a, a slipper that we may wear today, but we often see lots of slashing with those broad toes. And here we can see another one um, where we see punches, little cutouts in them, sort of that dag nature, and then the slashes running all the way down the sides. And sometimes in these shoes, you'll even see a bit of puffing in them to look as though the hosiery, the lower stocks have been pulled through, but often they're not. Okay. So with that said, um, we're in pretty good shape as far as the tutor. We have a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any questions about the terms about the Tudor style um, so that we can move on to Elizabethan for next time, for Thursday. It's a quiet room, quiet room. I'll just drink my coffee out of my, my Anne Boleyn mug. There we go, Anne Boleyn. Wow, if I was watching the video of this, I'd be like, that was the longest time that somebody hasn't talked. Okay. Um, so while we're here, while we have most of us here, if you look at the next section, the Elizabethan, 
I've gone through and I've made sure that you know all of the deadlines, what is happening. Please remember to meet with um, your partner for your first people's paper. Those do need to be turned in. You know, that's a big part of your grade. Please remember to also look at, um, you know, figuring out what your last thing is going to be, whether it's going to be the final exam, whether it's going to be a project, or you're going to turn in your visual notebook. So from those four things, you should be able to figure out what you're going to do. Those papers, if you and your teammate get them done early, please turn them in early. Um, that gives me a little bit of time, but it also gets them off your plate. And I know it can be very difficult, um, you know, through remote, through distance learning, but I think um, y'all are probably more prepared for that than many of us would have been um, to try to do that in the old days. And I think that's it. So Elizabethan is now up. I didn't put as much in the lecture because we'll talk a little bit more about the history on Thursday. And we're gonna basically do the same thing with Thursday being more of a lecture, more of a big idea of where we are. And then the Tuesday following, we will specifically go through each of those, um, uh, the slides and the terms so that we get a good sense of where we are. I put down two videos for this week. One is about kind of the whole Northern Renaissance and how it happened um, to develop and how they built up their wealth and that's a crash course. And then a silly little video that kind of just encapsulates Elizabeth's rise from being kind of the bastard child all the way up through to eventually becoming um, the queen, the monarch of England. Um, and my favorite part of it is all the figures are like little squares, little rectangles, and they just continually die and you just hear this thud. It's kind of bizarre and strange and fun. So, so keep that in mind. Um, I'm glad that you're enjoying six. It's weird. Um, it's moderately historically accurate, but it does give you a really good um, groove to clean your room or vacuum or, you know, be active. Um, uh, so here we are. Um, if anybody has any pets, now is the time to see those pets. Nothing? You don't have anything for me? No puppies or cows? Okay. Volker. David, I have a cat. <gasps> Look at that. Hello. What's your cat's name? Her name is Fluffinutter. She is 24 years old. 24? Yeah. Fluffinutter, <laughs> you are a survivor. I love it. I love it. She seems like a very good kitty. She is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Ryan. Oh, Ryan, look at that. Ryan, what is your little friend's name? You got to turn on your mic, though. His name is Gunner. He doesn't want to be picked up right now. Oh, Gunner, is he a good boy? Oh, he is a very good boy. We know he's a good boy. That's okay. Oh, he's a big boy. Hello, Gunner. Hello. Oh, look at that face. Look at that face. You're a very good boy, Gunner. Okay. Um, so everybody have a great day. If you um, have any challenges, I will um, make sure to try to give you all the information to find those recordings, as I had mentioned before, and hopefully you will stay safe. You need to stay safe and you need to stay home, please. I need to make sure that you're all taking care of yourself. And I will hang out for a couple more seconds. Uh, if you have any questions and you wanna either pop on through um, your mics or through the chat, okay? Have an awesome day and I will see you on Thursday. Thanks,